Good evening, everybody. Could we stay standing while we have prayers said by Father Michael Selby? Thank you to the Mayor, Councillor Roy Chamdell, and to you all for this opportunity to be with you and say prayers for your meeting. I speak to you all, whether you are of faith, are curious, or have none. Let us pray. Almighty God, who has made us people of relationship, we thank you for this borough of Hillingdon. We thank you for community and all the blessings that this brings. We ask your blessing on all citizens of this borough. Give your wisdom and equity to all who have responsibility and occupy positions of authority, that we may all seek truth, be honest in our dealings, and in our mutual service to the community, have standards of behavior and speech. We ask that you guide our thoughts and minds as we discuss and debate the issues on the agenda this evening. Give us respect for each other, and especially for those who hold opposing views to our own, that we may walk in each other's shoes before we argue, and that we never condemn, but seek the true welfare of all who live or work within our area of Hillingdon. At this time of remembering in church, temple, synagogue, and worship space, may we seek to be instruments of truth and peace in society so that we consider the welfare of all people. Bring justice where there is unfairness and peace where there is conflict. May we all walk with humility despite the high office which we may hold, and may this journey together enrich us all and bring joy to this area and trickle out into the nation. Creator God, we thank you for all who care for us, for the police, the firefighters, the street cleaners, the doctors, nurses, carers, those who light our streets, teachers, and all who serve in these council offices and in the community. We pray for fairness, justice, and loving care, which marks a just and ordered society. May we love each other as we love ourselves and our families, May we grow in mutual love and care. May we serve, free from all pride and self-assertion, and free from a desire to receive personal praise. Direct our thoughts and actions this night and for the rest of our time on earth, that we may seek out those who are lost, those who are lonely or in need, and through loving care, transform our community and our world. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father. That's absolutely fantastic. Every seat, every seat please. Okay, we move on to the agenda. Apologies for absence. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I have a number of apologies uh, from Councillors Arnold, Bliss, Deville, Graham, Herringy, Milani, Money, Nelson, Radia, Seaman Digby, and Stead. Agenda item two minutes. Uh, we all agree with these? Agreed. Any declarations of interest? Nope. Right, we go into my announcements. I start off with Armistice Day services, especially the one that we had on the Civic Centre on the forecourt. I thank everybody who turned up. It is a very strange time. When you hear of 
the loss of life that we had. Whole families to these wars. I was extremely honored to lay reefs to remember the sacrifices made for our freedom so we can meet into at places like this so we can debate. It was their sacrifice which allowed us to do this. The Lord Mayor's show was on once again, which was absolutely fantastic. We had a new Lord Mayor. And I must thank the Mayoress, my wife, for holding me back, especially when the Bangra floats came on and she quietly said in my ear, no, Mr. Mayor. I was going to nearly be up there. We continue to meet residents and groups. Uh, we're still loving it, so it's not too bad after six months. I want to say a big thank you for everybody who attended to remember Councillor Fife, a down-to-earth, decent man, and a really, really good councillor. Um, it was a fantastic turnout. Uh, we planted a tree for him, uh, along with his wife, Anna. She's a lovely lady. It's Christmas coming up. Uh, I'm now switching on Christmas lights, and it's fantastic to see the cheer amongst in our Hillington, the joy that it brings to the public, and also bringing them into our shopping parades. So they need it urgently. And last but not least, I had my booster on Monday. I do encourage everybody to go there, listen to the facts and the figures, especially amongst the Asian communities. We, for some reason, still are not going even getting our jabs. Uh, it's, as we've had that on the TV all the time, and people are saying it is essential in to beating this disease. And that's my announcement. Public question, number five. Mr. Mayor, uh, Mr. Ellis is unable to be here tonight and has asked that you put the question to Councillor Riley in his name. Councillor Riley. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm grateful to Mr. Ellis for his uh, question, which can be seen uh, in various uh, forms in the documents for this council meeting. I will be sending him uh, a very full and detailed written answer, which will be reproduced in the uh, minutes for this council meeting. So thank you. Thank you. We move on hasten to six. Councillor Edwards. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. With your permission, I would like to move the four items uh, within uh, item six uh, on block. The first matter is uh, just a simple technical issue resultant of the development of Harlington Community School. The second is a change of name of the planning committee following uh, feedback from residents. The third item relates to minor change of membership with two committees. And the final is uh, recommending that we join, uh, the Council joins the North West London Joint Health Overview and Scrutiny Committee. This will strengthen our ability to scrutinise the emerging sub-regional health or, uh, structure. And this matter also appoints memberships to that committee. So, Mr Mayor, with your permission, I, I invite Council to note the first and approve the, the following three. Thank you. Is that seconded? Uh, Mr Mayor, I second and formally reserve my right. Do you have any other speakers on this? Is that agreed? We now move on to agenda item seven, Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. I move the recommendation to appoint Tony Zayman as our interim chief executive, effective from the retirement of our present chief executive, Fran Beasley, on the 31st of December. And in so doing, I propose a vote of thanks to Fran for her service to the council and residents of this borough. Fran has been a member of the Hillingdon family since July 2008, when we enticed her away from Westminster. She became our Deputy Chief Executive and having impressed in that role, became our Substantive Chief Executive. Under her leadership, Fran has built a high-performing team that further cemented Hillingdon's reputation for excellence and efficiency. Working to her in a formal role, role I appreciated her inclusive and empowering leadership style. As leader, I have seen clearly her strengths of influencing and shaping, particularly in partnership working. It's early days for the Northwest London Integrated Care System, the NHS model for partnership working. But I know that Fran has positioned us exceedingly well, ensuring that Hillingdon's voice is not only heard, but respected. 
I'm told that Fran is renowned for her diction, her prose, and her obsession with the correct use of the apostrophe. And whilst I might joke about Fran having her work cut out with me in this respect, what it illustrates to me is her attention to detail, her doing the right things and doing the things right. Fran has ensured that the council continually proves itself to be innovative, agile, tenacious, responsive, and community focused. She has deftly steered this council through austerity, the pandemic, <coughs> numerous critical incidents. I have greatly valued the honesty and clarity of her advice, but secure in the knowledge of her loyalty to the borough and her respect for the democratic mandate of the administration. Fran will be tiring after more than 30 years in local government, a third of it with us in Hillingdon. She has earned our sincere thanks for a job very well done. And we should all, and I wish you the very best wishes for a fulfilling retirement. Well deserved. Uh, do we have a seconder for that? Uh, Mr. Mayor, I second and formally reserve my right. I know there are other speakers who will be speaking tonight to sing more of Fran's praises. I would like to join them ever so briefly uh, to add my voice to those that will be made, but my primary is to second uh, the appointment of Tony Salmon. Thank you. Councillor Curlin. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I, I echo the leader in welcoming Tony Zaman as the interim chief executive and look forward to working with him in the weeks and months to come. On behalf of the Labour Group, I would also like to express our thanks to Fran, who has served the borough and our residents extremely well throughout her time as Chief Executive Officer. As the Leader of the Opposition, I have had regular monthly meetings with Fran, as did my predecessors, and these have always been open, honest and confidential. Whilst the Chief Executive leads the Officer Corps in delivering the Administration's programme, the Chief Executive also has the responsibility to help all elected members carry out their democratic duty to serve the residents, and Fran has always managed this impeccably. Both the administration and the opposition can truly say that Fran has put the, the interests of the residents first and foremost. I would also like to add my personal thanks and best wishes to Fran and wish her a long and happy retirement. Councillor Sir Ray Puddyfoot. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I would like to add my thanks to Fran for her services to this council and the residents that we represent. I would also like to thank her for, whilst maintaining the political integrity that her office requires, her personal support for me when I was leader of the council. As I said often in the past, we have some of the best council officers in local government in Hillingdon, and Fran has led the Hillingdon team in delivering services that are the envy of residents in other boroughs. Fran, I hope that you enjoy your retirement, and if I may suggest, you could do worse and take up fishing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, and best wishes for the future. Do we have any other speakers? Cass Edwards, shall I do something? Okay, we go to the vote then. Show of hands, I think. Agreed. Is that agreed? agreed. <laughs> I was waiting for the punchline there. Thank you very much. Agenda item eight, Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Can the Cabinet Member for Environment, Housing and Regeneration provide an update on the progress that has been made by the Council to minimise the disruption to residents from the HS2 utility works? Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you to Councillor Tuckwell for his question. <coughs> the Council has raised significant concerns with HS2 about the extent of the required utility works across the Ricelip and Ickenham area in order to facilitate the delivery of their project. These matters were raised through the response to the environmental statement in 2014 through the petitioning phase in the Select Committee in 2015 and 2016, 
and have remained an ongoing concern since the Royal Assent to the HS2 Act in 2017. The concerns were accepted as part of the HS2 legal agreement signed by the Secretary of State for Transport, HS2 Limited and the Council. It was confirmed that HS2 would work with the Council to ensure utility works would be programmed and implemented to minimise disruption to community and businesses. The Council, both at officer and cabinet member level, have been pressing HS2 for detailed plans uh, covering these works throughout the whole of this year. These were first shared with us on the 7th of October 2021. The initial programme indicated that they wished to launch the tunnel boring machine at the end of April from the West Rice Slip portal, programming utility works from west to east starting at Ickenham High Road with the aim that the utilities reinforcements or replacement work is completed by the time TBM passes under the relevant road. The initially presented programme had a series of road closures from west to east commencing in January 22. Some of these closures including Ickenham Road which would have been a lane closure and West End Road full closure were planned to run concurrently for several weeks. Officers and members have made it abundantly clear that this approach was in conflict with the legal agreement, entirely unacceptable given the disruption and gridlock it would create for residents and businesses, and that HS2 has had since 2017 to complete their surveys and plan for these works, but it left it to the last possible moment. Council officers have moved very swiftly, and my thanks to them, uh, to present alternative proposals to ease the impact of these works. These options have included uh, the removal of street furniture on Ickenham Road to maintain two-lane running, as opposed to the 200-metre-plus lane closure HS2 originally envisaged, possibly using parts of the service road in West End Road as part of the carriageway. We did also suggest they might like to delay the launch of their TBM, but they didn't find favour with that suggestion. So. It has placed um, the council and its residents in a difficult position and it is a very disappointing place to find ourselves. The officer team, the leader and cabinet members are working hard to ensure HS2 reach a more amicable solution for residents and businesses, provide appropriate mitigation where necessary. They need to finalise their proposals but they have confirmed they have adopted our solution for Ickenham which will avoid the lane closures in Ickenham Road. This solution is positive. We are still engaging with them to get an improved proposal for West End Road, but we do now have sight of a programme where the closures will follow each other rather than being at the same time. So at least we are making progress. Uh, should they fail to deliver on a suitable solution for our residents, the Council will consider its options in liaison with the borough solicitor to challenge the programme extent of its works. We know we can't stop the HS2 programme, but it doesn't have to be delivered at any cost. We have also asked HS2 to embark on a full communication plan to ensure residents and businesses are fully informed, um, and, that would, and, and also to ensure that the emergency services and RAF Northolt are kept fully up to date with their plans. Um, I will keep uh, members informed of progress. Thank you for that. Do you have any supplementary? I have no supplementary, Mr. Mayor. Thank you. We now move on to 8.2. Councillor Morgan. Would help if I press the right button. Um, it's a question uh, to the Cabinet Member for Environment, Housing and Regeneration. Sorry, Councillor Lavery. What steps did the Council take to ensure the provision of a first class waste? and recycling service during the pandemic. Thank you. Councillor Lavery. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and my thanks to Councillor Morgan for his question. I know March 2020 uh, does seem a long time ago now when we first had a lockdown, and the advice to key workers to wash your hands, maintain two metres distance, a somewhat impossible task for a waste crew working in a single dust cart. By using the spare passenger minibuses that the Council had at the time, 
um, we were able to provide crews with a way of maintaining their rounds and social distancing. And uh, those of you who will remember from, from then, if you saw the waste cart, there was generally a minibus uh, following it around. Um, it did ensure that we maintained a full weekly service for, in all our waste streams for all of our residents, and that was not the case in every borough in West London. It was also at a time when the service was under significant pressure because with us all at home, um, waste tonnages suddenly went up. Um, more people seemed to get home deliveries instead of going shopping, and of course people ate more food at home. Uh, the service also developed a business continuity plan uh, to enable its managers to be divided uh, with some at home and some in the office to ensure there was always a team available to support them. <coughs> the result of this work was that we had a lower sickness rate in 2018 uh, than, uh, than we had in 2018 and 2020, which was not, again, the experience of others, and we received excellent feedback from our residents. This did result in our waste team being recognised at the Local Authority Recycling Advisory Committee Celebration Award in 2020, uh, where we won the best team of the year. Yeah. I'm also pleased to share um, with Council that the team has won a further award this year uh, for the best partnership award uh, for their work um, with the NHS um, to recycle uh, used needles, used syringes. Um, the council had an issue because people quite rightly regarded them as recyclable. They ended up in recycling uh, bags with a risk to our staff. Um, so we worked with, NH with NHS in order to um, provide uh, suitable boxes so that people could dispose of the service, uh, their needles safely. But it also meant we reduced the risk to our staff of being accidentally um, stabbed. The service has been an enormous success with an increase in demand of 110% between March 2020 and August 2021. And it resulted in the team winning the Best Partnership <coughs> Award this year from the Local Authority Recycling Advisory Committee on the 6th of October. So again, my congratulations <laughs> to the team. Do you have a supplementary? <coughs> Thank you, Mr Mayor. Yes, I do. And uh, how will this service be maintained across the Chris coming Christmas period? Thank you. Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I am delighted uh, to inform everyone tonight that the Council will be maintaining a full waste service throughout uh, the Christmas period this year. Um, the crews are happy to work um, the relevant bank holidays so that we will not be in a position where we're having to shuffle the days which would have gone on for several weeks at much inconvenience to our residents. So collection days for all of our services will remain exactly as they are normally. Yeah. Question 8.3, Councillor Richard Mills. Thank you, Mr Mayor. My question is also for the Cabinet Member for Environment, Housing and Regeneration. <laughs> Can the Cabinet Member please update Council on the result of this year's London in Bloom competition? Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and thank you, Councillor Mills. Um, and this is uh, more, more, more good news for you. Um, I can confirm that Hillingdon was awarded a gold in the large city category this year, uh, pipping both Ealing and Lambeth to be judged the best yeah. overall winner. <laughs> for Hillingdon, the judge commented, the standard of horticulture is extremely high. The Gold Award is a significant achievement and represents the Council's commitment to putting residents first with high quality um, green and public spaces. And I must express my thanks to the Green Spaces team, to Paul Richards, Stuart Hunt and the team for all of their work in, in achieving this for us. There are also um, two other awards, or a number of other awards, but two in particular I want to draw um, your attention to. 
uh, and these do go south-north, so there's, there's one in each. Uh, Harmonsworth Village won the London Village category, and Eastcote won the large London Village category. Those who know Eastcote well will know that uh, the Friends of Eastcote House Gardens do an absolutely fabulous job in maintaining um, that facility uh, in Eastcote. Uh, and they, got, uh, they were crowned winners in the, in the Our Community category. Eastcote House Gardens got the top park of the year and the Friends of Eastcote House Gardens won the Walled, Walled Garden category. Um, there was also an award an Outstanding Achievement Award for the Chair of the East Coat House Gardens, uh, Leslie Crowcroft. So my congratulations uh, to the friends for all the work that they have done. Um, also, there was a Silver Guild Award for Long Meadow in East Coat in the large conservation category. So the, those who've worked in and around East Coat House Gardens have clearly done a tremendous amount of work. There is some council support, but this is largely... Um, uh, a team of very dedicated volunteers who work extremely hard and have done for many years um, and you know their awards are well deserved Thank you. do we have a supplementary yes mr mayor um, following the good news in his answer could he please advise council how many green flags hillingdon won in this year's awards? I was, about to say, I was about to say Council Bianco, but Council Avery once again. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No, there is no map, Mr. Uh, I, I, we, we, uh, but I am delighted, I am delighted uh, to, in, to inform Council that three more of our parks, that would take us to 63, that does um, mean we are still out in front nationally, so thanks to the legacy left to me by Council Bianco. Um, the, the, three, uh, the three areas were Column Green in Brunel Ward, um, popular with those who like to keep active with its recently installed outdoor, outdoor gym, children's, the newly refurbished children's playground, and the joint project between the council and charity Trees for Cities, uh, planting trees. Uh, also in, in the south of the borough, Sipson Meadow and Heathrow Villages, um, the comment being it helped to reduce noise, a new shelter belt plan, planting scheme, um, which also provides major benefits for local wildlife, and again, a refurbished children's playground. And then one final one was Dean Park in South Ryslip, um, which provides a focal point for meeting uh, activities for local organisations, a, a multi-use games area for entertainment, and recent improvements include an outdoor gym and seasonal wide plow bed. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> that indeed is a good news story because I do have many conversations with other mayors from other boroughs and I do tell them how many green flags we have. That's a must. 8.4, Councillor McQuana. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I note that the council has been awarded the early permanence quality mark. How has this been achieved and what does this mean for Hillingdon? Thank you. Councillor Palmer. Thank you, Mr Mayor, and uh, thank you, Councillor McCarna, for your question. I would just like to thank Councillor Lavery for allowing me to stand and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, I hope it's OK if I answer the question, Councillor Lavery. In the spirit of the awards, I am now going to champion social care, and I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate Q de Kureshwa in our children's services, who last night won the Team Leader of the Year, the Gold Award at the Social Work Awards. Yeah. Very, very well deserved. I welcome this opportunity to talk about early permanence. Having been on our fostering panel for six years prior to my cabinet role and found it exceptionally rewarding. Early permanence is an umbrella term used when talking about certain types of adoption for babies and young children, usually under the age of two. It includes adopting a child through fostering for adoption and concurrent planning placements. Both schemes enable a child in care under the age of two to find foster carers who are ready and willing to adopt them later 
if the courts decide they cannot be cared for permanently by their birth family. This enables young children to experience a loving and secure home in which they can feel safe and settled as quickly as possible. Babies who are looked after from a very young age are often moved between several foster carers while the courts reach a decision about their long-term care. Early permanence removes this uncertainty and disruption by placing, as the name suggests, early on in their lives. I am positive that everyone in this chamber can understand that this makes a significant difference for young children and babies at an age when each day in a stable environment has such a positive, long-lasting effect on their lives for the future. Throughout the pandemic, our social care team, including those social workers who work to support our foster carers and help our looked-after children find permanency, have worked tirelessly to continue this role. Our fostering panel have continued to meet and, like all of us, adapted their working to online panels. This has ensured the safety of our children and foster carers and placements have been able to continue. This in itself is to be praised. The quality mark is awarded by the Centre for Early Permanence. To achieve this, you must evidence excellent practice in achieving performance at the earliest opportunity for children who are likely to be adopted. The aim is to avoid unnecessary changes of carer for children in their early years to support good development and attachment. This is achieved by matching children with duly approved specially trained carers who are both foster carers and adopters. Although a child may likely to be adopted, the work is carried out in parallel to where possible reunite, reunite children with their families. Our practice was found to meet all of the quality standards for this award, from the identification of children suitable for early permanence, through to finding and matching of carers, to the swift decision making of our legal team and the ambitious for Hillenden adoption team, together with our court team. Assessors expressed their decision that early permanence had been championed by senior managers and we had an impressive learning culture about the approach in our desire to be fully child-centred. And here we are, here is the nub of it. We are the only London local authority that has achieved this early permanence quality mark. And whilst many are working towards it, we have set the bar for local authorities to follow. It is a proud moment for me as Cabinet member and all of us as corporate parents that we are part of an authority that ensures children are given a strong, stable start as early as possible. My congratulations to Children's Social Care and all those who work for this award, particularly Deanna Nelson. Do we have a supplementary? No, thank you, Mr Mayor. Thank you. We now move on to motions and polite reminder again, please, I know you practice your speeches. Keep an eye on the time. Yeah. Councillor Duncan. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I think many, if not all of us, will be aware of the proposed planning bill and the proposals to radically change the planning system in the country. These proposals involve zoning land into three categories of growth, renewal and protection. Growth will, by definition, automatically allow new development, renewal some development and protection none. At the heart of these proposals is the wish to speed up the planning system and build more homes. These are blunt and fearsome proposals that cut through the ability of local authorities to shape, refine and approve the planning pol policies for their areas and have given rise to much comment and opposition throughout the country. Although there is much, much that could be said about the details of these proposals, I am not doing that today. 
But there is one aspect of this that has moved me to bring this motion to Council tonight, and that is that there will be no right of objection by individuals to development in growth and renewal zones. At a stroke, the right for our residents to work with us on shaping our borough will be removed at the application stage. In this country, we have an old democracy and free speech, but this will be set aside as developments will be automatically approved by law without the need to take into account any objection or hear any voice at the application stage. In Hillingdon, we have seen the effects of prior approval legislation that has turned office blocks into homes with very little we can say about it and very limited prescribed grounds for our planning committees to refuse such developments. The early legislative changes that brought this about later had to be modified to state that rooms should have windows as some homes approved under this legislation did not have them. Is this the quality of housing we wish to see? Of course not. We have also seen the effects of the HS2 legislation, which has approved major development in the borough. The HS2 applications we receive are determined with our hands virtually tied behind our backs, as we have very limited grounds to comment on them. Do we want to extend this to other major housing developments in the borough with even less voice to object to the effects it will have on us? We have seen residents' objections to developments such as that at the Master Brewer site, which have rightly had to be considered under current legislation. Under the new proposals, they would not have a voice. The need to provide housing is a big driver behind these proposals, but it is not the planning system that is the sole cause of lack of supply. There exists in this country planning permission that has not been implemented for over a million homes. It is the delivery of these planning permissions that is the issue, and taking away people's right to object to developments will not change this. In Hillingdon, we have a proud tradition of working with our residents on shaping development in the borough and opposing unsuitable development like the third runway, which would carve through our village communities in the south. I hope all of us wish to continue to work with our residents on planning and development matters rather than see things imposed on them. There is hope that the government is having second thoughts about the proposals, as Robert Jenrick has been replaced by Michael Gove, who is reported to be giving the proposed changes to the planning system a complete rethink, with the outcome that the upcoming planning bill is likely to be less radical than previously thought. I think it is important that government ministers are able to hear what local authorities with first-hand, front-line, on-the-ground experience of delivering planning services have to say on this matter. Good government collects input from the widest informed sources it can before legislating. My hope is that this will be a matter all of us as Hillingdon councillors can agree and that we can add our voice to many other authorities throughout the country of all political colours in letting the government know that whatever is carried forward, it should always retain our residents' right to speak about what is or is not acceptable in terms of development in the borough. I move. Do we have a seconder? Councillor Sweeting. Thank you, Mr Mayor. I speak in support of the motion. The current freedom which allows us to comment on and object to developments which closely affect us is at the heart of our local democracy. However, the government's planning for the future proposals were designed to streamline and reduce local stakeholder involvement in planning matters so that they would be more central government rules based. At a stroke, this would have taken away our current rights which allowed individual residents, residents groups and their elected representatives to have a say in development which would have, if allowed, would affect lives and communities. The government's three zones of growth, renewal and protected 
would have produced a national rather than our present local approach in deciding what will be built in our own backyard. Its aim was to fast track planning approvals for if the homes of our residents happened to fall within growth zone, it would have meant substantial development such as that proposed for the master brewer site receiving automatic approval. Even the area designated as renewal, the presumption would have been in favor of development. Only the area marked protected would have been protected. In Theresa May's words, it would have been a developer's charter. However, deep sigh of relief, the 44,000 comments received objecting to the proposals and with opposition from all quarters, including Conservative Bob Seeley, MP, who in the debate in July called the reforms flawed and undeliverable, the government has now made pause. Oliver Dowden, Conservative Chairman, MP, has indicated that the party will need to look again. And with Michael Gove now stating last month that communities would be allowed to take back control, it could mean that the traffic light system of growth, renewal and protected would fall or come back in a different guise. We now await the details of the U-turn with bated breath, but the final version of the new rules is currently hard to predict. I therefore ask this council, our council, to continue to lobby its own Conservative government as so many councils and individuals have been doing over the past months, so that residents' right to object to individual planning applications remain. Please support the motion. Thank you. Councillor Tuckwell. Thank you, Mr Mayor. And on behalf of this Conservative administration and as chairman of the Major Applications Planning Committee, I would like to thank Councillor Duncan for her motion this evening. It should also be placed on record that Councillor Duncan's contribution to our planning committees is well respected and held in high regard by members on both sides of this chamber. Yeah. Killingdon under Conservative control has a proud history of an effective, thorough and rightfully scrutinised approach to planning applications both large and small. Many members in this chamber have and continue to serve on Hillingdon's planning committees where applications are debated, scrutinised and tested against planning policies and legislation to ensure that the interests of Hillingdon's housing, landscapes, street scenes and commercial spaces are at the forefront of our decision. Members will also want to recognise the high quality support and professional expertise provided by our officer team across a range of departments, notably planning, highways, green spaces, democratic services and our legal team. The government in 2020 published a white paper outlining its ideas for significant changes to the planning system. The white paper entitled Planning for the Future was published by the government for consultation in August of 2020. Members of this chamber and many of our residents will be aware that some of the proposals have been subject to critical feedback. These proposals included a shift away from public engagement on individual planning applications and a greater reliance on zoning plans. London Borough of Hillingdon submitted a response to the consultation which was approved by our Cabinet in October 2020. It is therefore good to see that this motion fits completely with the decision taken by our Cabinet, where this administration's concerns are that the proposed changes have the potential to dramatically change how planning in Hillingdon is delivered, with the potential for a negative impact on our residents, businesses and other service users. So far, the Government has received over 40,000 responses to the proposed reforms, which I understand are still being reviewed. Whilst we are not expecting a response from government until later this year, we can expect there to be further opportunities to comment on the emerging proposals. I can assure members and residents that this administration will comment actively on any developments during this consultation process, as it is vital that the planning interests of Hillingdon are designed, scrutinised and approved by people who know Hillingdon. In summary, I would like to again thank Councillor Duncan for her motion this evening, as it clearly recognises the concerns already submitted by the Conservative administration. The Conservative group therefore accept the motion with no amendments. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Councillor Lavery. Um, thank you, Mr Mayor. Uh, you'll be pleased to know I don't have a long speech on this one. Uh, a lot of it has, been, has already been said. Um, I too welcome the motion from Councillor Duncan. Um, 
The motion relates to the proposed planning reforms originally proposed by the then Secretary of State, Robert Jenerick, proposing zoning and planning um, with implied approvals um, depending on the zone you were in. The new Secretary of State, Michael Gove, has now paused these plans and we would expect them to be significantly revised. The Cabinet response um, to the consultation has already made clear that we did not support uh, the proposed changes, which would have restricted the right of members um, to the plan-making stage alone and not to determining individual applications. The process would also have severely restricted the ability of residents to comment on individual planning applications. I served on the planning committee for many years and I am well aware that the, the committee itself provides an important level of scrutiny and challenge to planning applications and is a valuable mechanism for residents informing us of their views. And those views have, on a number of occasions, improved a planning application or resulted in it being um, deferred or rejected because they've drawn matters to the attention of the committee using their local knowledge. Planning committees are, and the planning system locally, is best placed together with local stakeholders to understand the impact of a particular development on the area to which it relates. I therefore fully support this motion. Do you have any other speakers? Councillor Duncan. Uh, thank you, Mr Mayor, and um, thank you to um, the Conservative group and uh, planning colleagues who've spoken uh, well on this. I'm very grateful to them that we can put forward um, a motion that we all agree on and it will have strength and, and a greater voice, I hope, because of that. Thank you. Is that agreed? Going to motion 9.2, Councillor Mathers. Mr. Mayor, it's been all over the news. No, not the lineup of I'm a celebrity, get me out of here, but COP26. The 2021 United Nations Climate Change Conference, most commonly referred to as COP26, which was hosted here in the UK and finished last week. Climate change is now the number one political issue for adults in the UK, and we've long been awaiting for that, not just a political concern, but a concern for all of us. Through COP26, many countries came together to tackle climate change, and as full council, we came together uh, two years ago to pass a motion to take climate change action. They met as COP26 with the intention of building strong commitments from world leaders to tackle the climate change crisis and remove, or sorry, reduce carbon. They met to build on previous agreements, and equally, we as a council must do the same, come together and build on what is being done and what has been decided. This motion that I'm moving tonight is building on our agreed climate change action plan and strengthening our commitment as a council to tackle global warming. The climate change action plan strategy should not be static, but a dynamic thing an engaging project that empowers us and our residents to raise and rise against the challenge of climate change. Hillington Council cannot wait for national governments to lead, but we must be ambitious for a better Hillington. Having said that, now COP26 has ended and agreements have been signed, and we do wait with bated breath to see if world leaders will stick to their word. And as global citizens, we should keep them account both nationally and internationally where possible. Strong public engagement is a great way to strengthen accountability of political promises. And this motion builds in more public engagement reporting to keep the council administration and future council administrations to account. Residents want to work with us collaboratively. They want to tackle climate change with us, as do local stakeholders, including our local community groups. This motion tonight pushes to improve the council's efforts, not dismiss what's already been achieved, but calling us to double down on our commitment to tackling climate change, as this is the biggest threat to life as we know it. This 
motion also recognises the spending power of Hillington Council and its wider influence and calls on the administration to use the procurement processes and to investigate how we invest our money in order that we do not undo what good we're doing through the way we spend our money. Having stronger environmental conditions in our procurement process and changing our investment plans to, for example, avoid fossil fuel creators will save lives as it reduces carbon emissions, encourages biodiversity and reduces air pollution, thus building a better Hillenden. I move. We have a second. Councillor Sansapuri. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. May I start in seconding this motion by reminding us all that from 1901 to 2012, there was a warming trend in almost every corner of the world, which has caused mainly by the human activities. The Earth's climate used to be affected by natural hazards such as solar activity, changes in Earth orbit and volcanic activities. However, since the first industrial resolution in 1760, which resulted into an increasing concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, human factors has gradually overshadowed natural ones to become the main contributor to climate change. Climate change has in turn has become a more significant challenge for human beings at present and in the future. Climate change is projected to worsen the health of the people in many areas in the 21st century, especially in the low-income, income-developing countries. However, let's remember that climate change affects not only human beings, but also delicate balance of our local ecosystem. Since the mid-20th century, there has been one heat wave after another, putting vulnerable and elderly residents at risk of heat exhaustion. In Hillington, climate changes also increase and risk of flooding with heavy downpour leading to residents being evacuated from their homes. Local government is on the front line and is responsible for taking any wide range of decisions that can make or break the success of any international strategy on the climate change. Local authorities are ultimately responsible for making a policy a reality. According to UNDP estimate, more than 70% of climate changes reduction measures and up to 90% of climate changes adoptions measures are undertaken by local government. Projects delivered locally are best as they are designed to reflect local circumstances and it is these tailor-made solutions that allow us to take effective action in tackling climate changes as a borrow. We must do this in all areas of public spending, going beyond the directly delivered services and into our procured services. We must use our spending power to affect change in our supplier, but not just in council service, but also in council investment too. Finally, Mr. Mayor, I am happy to second this motion as it is increased resident voices as well as transparency and accountability to bring about a better environment and a better borrow for our resident. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. I support this motion. Councillor Lavery. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I am rising to um, propose a minor amendment um, to uh, the motion proposed by Councillor Mavers, uh, and I do hope that this will be um, accepted in the spirit that it is intended as a friendly amendment. Um, the amendment makes a, some minor changes to the wording. Uh, in, in the section regarding procurement, it adds where practical and cost effective uh, that the Council's procured services will be net carbon zero by 2035. Uh, amending the second point to have the word net in front of zero carbon. Um, and also we have deleted uh, the reference to pensions. Uh, other investments, happy to renew, but obviously pension policy um, is, is decided um, to a large degree on, on, on the advice we are given, um, obviously with the objective of providing the relevant pensions uh, for the officers. Um, so we don't think that that would be appropriate. Um, we are all aware of the importance of acting on climate change and the COP26 conference has brought that home to us. Um, we've all seen the increasing um, 
weather events that uh, continue uh, to dominate the news um, and even impact us locally. In July 2021, the Council adopted a strategic climate action plan, setting out six climate corporate commitments and over 60 strategic objectives. The plan was subject to an extensive 12-week consultation and we did receive a high level of public interest. The corporate commitments and action plans will be achieved through 16 action plans and the plan is due for a formal review in 2024. However, the Council included in the corp corporate climate commitment six to remain open to the opportunity to go further, to be innovative and creative to the stated goals whenever possible. As we were the first to acknowledge uh, that what is possible in this area is going to develop over the coming years. Therefore, we are happy um, to accept the, the changes uh, to suggested for procurement, and indeed the uh, Council um, Directorate looking after procurement um, has already actually got a proposal that is on my desk at the moment, so that will come forward very quickly um, to us. We need to lead... We can't influence what all of our businesses do, of course not, but we can lead and lead by example in this borough and assist them where we can to reduce their own uh, carbon footprint and to become net zero. We will look at our investment strategy outside of, of pensions. I, the only comment I would make on that and the comment I've had back from the finance team, of course, is that our investment strategy is largely... Uh, cash based and about treasury management. <coughs> Thank you. I, Councillor Lavery. I, I will. I move. Do we have a second to that? Councillor Edwards. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Um, I'm pleased to formally second this motion uh, and, and I welcome it as feedback that we need to do more to explain our commitment uh, to the climate change. COP26 is a reminder to us all of the perilous path that humanity is presently following that time is running out and that further change is necessary. There are no differences between us in this chamber about our understanding of what needs to be achieved. The motion builds on our climate pledge of January 2020 and our strategic action plan already mentioned. We're pleased to strengthen that action plan by incorporating the Climate Change Act requirement to achieve net carbon zero by 2050. And we're also pleased to include a commitment to work with our suppliers to move as quickly as reasonably possible to them achieving net zero carbon status. Phraseology is important in this manner, hence our amendments to insert the word net in two places. We must be mindful of the burden that requiring our suppliers to achieve net zero carbon will place on them, particularly on our small and medium-sized businesses. We will not unreasonably cut across our strategic aim of supporting local business by increasing our, our procurement from them. Adding a new criteria in our procurement process will require companies to calculate and monitor their emissions. Our larger suppliers will more easily be able to do this, and so we shall be looking to them to move earlier than we will expect our smaller suppliers. Hence the need for the addition of the amendment of reasonableness and practicality. Furthermore, this administration will assure our residents that the climate change policies that we adopt will not increase inequalities by loading costs onto the poorer households a further reason for our qualifi qualified approach. Climate change is of such importance to our residents, including our young people, that it is right that they should be afforded the opportunity each year to provide feedback on our climate change strategy, our actions and achievements, and help us to strengthen our approach. This is wholly consistent with our community engagement strategy and our annual review of key actions. I am pleased that members have come together on this critically important issue. To achieve consensus, we have each given a little, but in doing so, our unity has strengthened the Council's position and our resolve to reduce the climate impact of our borough. Thank you. I send you.
Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just for clarification purposes, we are now debating the proposed amendment as set out at the bottom of page four, top of page five, with the effect of the amended motion that is set out on page five. Councillor Simmons, you indicated before the amendment was moved, I presume it's the amendment you wish to speak on. Councillor Simmons. Well, thank you very much indeed, Mr. Mayor. I'm here tonight moonlighting in my second job, but that is an opportunity... <laughs> it is a, an opportunity to support this motion as amended. Um, clearly, uh, any discussion of climate cannot go past without mention of the elephant in Hillingdon's room, which is Heathrow. And I think it is really welcome that Hillingdon continues to challenge robustly any expansion plans because of the impact that that would have on uh, our local community. But I wanted to make two particular points which I know uh, are falling very much on receptive ears in government. The first is about the usefulness of council involvement in developing green strategies. And the experience in particular with the Green Homes Grant has been that the funds expended by local authorities on improving the environmental friendliness of council housing have demonstrated significantly greater value for money than the private sector grant schemes. So clearly there is a strong view in government that is through local authorities that the greatest efficiency, the greatest bang for the buck in improving the environmental friendliness of our housing stock can be achieved. And the second point is I'd like to particularly commend uh, Councillor Lavery's comments in respect of pension investments because one of the key points that came out of COP26 is that when we look at big oil, and in particular British big oil firms like Shell and BP, they are playing an enormous role in driving our net zero ambitions. So if you buy your fuel from Shell, for example, you can now drive carbon neutral by offsetting. Uh, if you are using a zero harmful emissions hydrogen vehicle, it is likely to be BP that gets that hydrogen to you, uh, whether that is a bus or a van or a private vehicle. It is the forecourts of those uh, petrol companies, those fuel companies, that are making it possible for people to use electric cars the length and breadth of this country. And the contribution that British Big Oil has made towards net zero is far greater than any number of tech unicorns. So it is welcome that we see before us a common sense motion that says review the impact and avoid the kind of boycotting and divestment strategy that we've seen some seeking to advocate. So, Mr. Mayor, it seems to me this very much represents a motion once again that shows Hillingdon Council at its best, supporting our residents to make a difference in this case on climate change. Councillor Morse. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Just going to fill in some information. I appreciate and welcome the fact that the Conservatives amended it in a sensible way and didn't completely annul the motion. I want to go on to some of the agencies we will be dealing with. It's the Energy Network Agency. They have very clear plans of what they're going to do. In 2023, they're going to introduce gas networks which have 20% hydrogen. The, the process is to actually introduce hydrogen as an energy form. 25 to 30, they're going to have introduced net gas networks with 100% hydrogen. Now, the relevance to Hellingdon is the air quality management area, which we declared in 2003 and has never, ever been resolved. This, if this policy, if we actively got involved in this and we introduced this, this, what this network agency is going to do, we can actually remove the air quality management area because it's been caused by fossil fuels. So this, as well as the world changing, uh, we are actually looking at a substantial improvement in the situation because the technology is, is, an, is an, a serious advancement we're Because unfortunately we also have the airport, but the aircraft can run on methane, which is NH3, and hydrogen. So that one of the policies should be that we actually encourage the airfield to actually look at alternative energy sources. Um, but I don't, I'm not totally negative on this because this agency, and they, this agency pipes, runs all the gas lines in the UK and Ireland, interestingly. I don't know why they've got, they actually got that. They are a very powerful unit and they have very clear policies on what they're going to try and do. I suppose some of the, I, I mean, all the government has talked about is um, hydrogen towns. I, I'm not quite saying what that means. But this, this organisation, which we should actually actively get involved with, has very clear plans how to solve this problem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. 
Thank you. Are there any other speakers? Councillor Mathers. Thank you, Mr Mayor. Um, many of us felt disappointment when, or feel disappointment when last minute wording is changed, as in the COP26 agreement. However, in this instance, slight wording amendments to our motion have been extremely helpful and I appreciate the collaborative approach. And the Labour Group will be supporting the amended motion at work when it's agreed. Uh, the amendment also helps us focus the motion on the targets that can be reached rather than being dismissed uh, as unachievable or unattainable by future administrations. The amendment keeps the intention of the motion to improve our efforts and double down on collective commitment to tackling climate change. The amendment keeps the focus on public engagement and accountability, which is fundamental. Hillens and Labour do accept these amendments as friendly. But we are putting the administration on notice as we as opposition will continue to be a critical friend on matters of environment and tackling climate change. We will continue to call the administration to account. We will continue to push for stronger action on tackling climate change, in a friendly way, of course. And we expect the Hillington Conservatives to do exactly the same for us when we are in administration as a Labour-run <laughs> Hillington Council in a future year. <laughs> Councillor Lavery. Mr Mayor, nothing further to add. So we put that in vote. Is that agreed? Yeah. Thank Wonderful. you, Mr Mayor. That becomes a substantive motion as shown on page five, which just requires formal agreement. Is that agreed? Yeah. Uh, just before we end, I, you know, it's our last meeting before, the fest before Christmas, so, and we meet again in January, so I'd just like to wish everybody a very happy festive period and look forward to meeting again next year. Thank you.